Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day and welcome to Advocacy Anywhere powered by American Jewish Committee. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content and advocacy from wherever you are. We are delighted to be joined today by Dr. Lily Edwards, Professor Emerita of History and African-American Studies at Drew University and Stephen Fischler and Joel Sucher, co-producers of the 2000 documentary From Swastika to Jim Crow to discuss the little known story of German Jewish refugees who expelled from their homeland by Hitler and the Nazis, found new lives and careers at historically black colleges and universities in the American South. Moderating today's conversation is Dove Volker, director of AJC Atlanta and AJC National Director of Black Jewish Relations. After we hear from Dove and our esteemed guests, we will take your questions. You may email your question to questions at ajc.org, that's questions plural, or use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Dove, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, and good afternoon to our wonderful audience. We're delighted to be with all of you today. Uh, and because we have a limited time for today's conversation, we're going to just jump right on in. And we're going to start with a question uh, for both Joel and Stephen, uh, the producers of the film. So the story of From Swastika to Jim Crow is about the Jewish refugees, primarily from Germany, who were hired to teach at HBCUs. Uh, we had a brief conversation bef uh, before the program began, and I don't think either of your accents are necessarily Southern accents. Uh, so I am wondering, uh, how did you all become interested in the topic of this film and how, how did you end up making the film? Well, we've always been involved in social issue films from our beginning in 1969. And we've always been interested in historical episodes that were never widely covered. So I think on one trip I, I, I made to Miami, there was a letter that I led it to the editor from a John Hers, who talked about, you know, I think that there was a, uh, a kerfuffle. I forgot where, was that Howard University, Steve? Yeah, it was a, there was a, an episode at Howard University where a speaker from the Nation of Islam was going to give a speech and there was a whole lot, there were a number of protests and there was a debate about, is it anti-Semitism or free speech? And this thing got debated back and forth and there was a, a lot of press about uh, the whole question of black anti-Semitism. And in light of that, uh, Professor John Hers, who had taught at Howard University, wrote a letter to the editor of the New York Times Joe, you want to describe that? Yeah, so the thing is, he basically said in this letter, well, you know, amid all this, uh, the uh, sturm and drang of this situation, she said, I remember a time when I taught at a black college, Howard University, and my relationship with the students was simply an amazing one. Um, I called Steve and I said, hey, you know, let's check this out. And we tracked John Hurst down. He actually lived not far from where our office was in Hastings at the time. He lived in Scarsdale. So we, we pestered this guy. He thought that we were telecallers. He would not take our messages. We yeah, I would really call and he would, he thought it was a, I was a salesman. <laughs> he would hang up. So I wrote him a letter. He never responded. We were, sent it a letter FedEx figuring everyone's going to open a FedEx envelope when it comes at eight in the morning. Now, eventually we, we got through and he goes, oh, of course, come over. And, and he just turned out to be like a really a great guy and a font of real information. And in his letter to the Times, he said, you know, I remember a time when black institutions lent a helping hand to refugee scholars like me. And he mentioned a book by Gabriel Edgecombe from Swastika to Jim Crow. And we, well, of course we met with Professor Hurst, but we did contact Gabrielle and we went down to Washington DC to visit her and she was great and you know we were all we were, you know we sort of we had a plan we were going to make it that we were going to make this into a documentary which we did it took a couple of years to actually get it done mostly for fundraising uh, but 
Gabrielle was a great help and she introduced us to, gave us leads to find different people. And there were some people we found on our own. And um, the film really tells that story. Yeah, but the thing is you can't have to, Gabrielle was instrumental in making this happen. Unfortunately, she passed away before the film was, was completed, which was a tragedy. She was smart. She was snarky and cynical in a very kind of pleasing way, which is why I got along with her very, uh, all the time. She really made this happen. She did the primary source research and it was all on her nickel. Her background was she had been born in Germany had come over before the war and she was very much involved in civil rights stuff in the, in the 50s. I mean, she made this happen. Um, if it yeah, wasn't for her, this would not have happened. She was the one who, who noticed this whole phenomenon of refugee scholars at HBCUs. I mean, of course it was happening, but you know, this was a time when there was no Facebook, there was no refugee scholars, you know, group on, on Facebook. And she saw this as a phenomena and she sought out and did a lot of oral history interviews. So, you know, Joe was right. She really, um, uh, I don't think we would have made the film if she hadn't done the research and written the book that she did write. Gotcha. And now a quick follow-up question. I, the, the film is about 56 minutes long. How much, uh, how many hours of filming did you, uh, did you actually end up taking before you cut it down to, to that time? Well, that's always a big, you know, we were shooting 16 millimeter. That was like all pre-digital stuff. So, <laughs> you know, it's a different world, but we shot hours and hours. I forgot what the ratio would have been maybe five times we shot five oh, times more than we actually. Maybe we shot 30 hours of film or 40 wow. hours or something like that. And the problem is that, you know, film is a limited medium. It's not like a book or an article where you can just shove in everything. You got to kind of pick and choose what you think is most important and what's going to advance the story. Yeah. So there's a lot of material that, you know, and outtakes, you call them, that we have in the archive. But the stuff is, it was just, I thought, magical. Yeah. So let's, um, I want to bring Dr. Edwards into the conversation. So, Dr. Edwards, you, you've been involved in a number of conversations specifically around in this film. How did you first get connected to the subject matter? Well, uh, Dove, I actually was introduced to this topic through the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Center at Drew University, where as director of Pan-African Studies, we did a lot of co-sponsored programs. They, in 1999, uh, Dr. Joyce Ladner, who was a student of Professor Ertz Berinsky at Tougaloo, uh, did a presentation for Drew um, on her experiences at Tougaloo with her teacher and mentor, Dr. Berinsky. And so that was my introduction. Uh, it was just before the documentary would have been uh, released. With the release of the documentary, the Genocide and Holocaust, the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Center at Drew did a program specifically using the film, and I was the facilitator. Following that, I have gotten several invitations to help facilitate this film showing, uh, including uh, just last year, the Capitol Museum, the Capitol Jewish Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, did a program on uh, uh, refugee scholars at Black colleges. They did not show the film. And so what I've also developed using um, uh, Gabrielle Simon um, Hedgecombe's book is a presentation that flushes out kind of the background story, right? I realized that people really don't know a great deal about Nazi Germany. And they definitely did not connect the Holocaust story in Nazi Germany and anti-Semitism with book burnings, the expulsion of Jewish scholars from universities, I believe as many as like 33, 34 universities all over Germany. Um, so that people hearing the story understand the horror of what is happening to refugee professors. Then on the other hand, People also really didn't have the background story of anti-Semitism in the United States. You know, I realize even in some of the K through 12 work I do and the requirements to teach the Holocaust, more recently I've been thinking, 
we also need to teach about anti-Semitism in the United States, because that also becomes part of the story of the Jewish refugee scholar experience in the US. Um, people also aren't familiar with the history of HBCUs. There are a few names people may know, right? People may know Howard, uh, <laughs> um, but for the most part, uh, people really don't know that history. And so, I use this experience of the Jewish refugee scholars to kind of connect the dots, right, CSI style, uh, between these kind of multi-layered histories that, uh, as the film shows so brilliantly, these multi-layered disparate histories, right? In some ways, we're saying they're histories that are thousands of miles apart converge on these black college campuses. And it becomes a kind of powerful humanistic story about those linkages that one doesn't really, uh, one doesn't really expect. It's, it's, it's fascinating to, to sort of yeah. hear how, how well-rounded it is. And, and for our audience, uh, you'll hear the term HBCU often uh, in today's conversation. HBCU stands for Historically Black Colleges and Universities. And in Atlanta, where I live, uh, we've got three, well, we've, got, we've got a number, but the most well-known are obviously Morehouse, Spelman, Clark Atlanta. Uh, they all make up the Atlanta University Center. Uh, Morehouse and Spelman are, are single sex colleges, but share a campus along with Clark Atlanta. Uh, and and the, one of the things that I always found so interesting about, about, about HBCUs, and I wasn't aware of this history until I actually saw the film uh, a number of years ago. But I'm wondering, so as a part of the film and a part of the book, um, we learned that roughly 1,200 scholars came from Germany, were expelled from, from German universities and came to the United States. And about 50 of them, 5-0, went to the HBCUs. It, what happened to the rest? And, and who was, and I, and I, I guess um, Albert Einstein is probably the most famous of the Jewish refugee scholars. And he, well-known, went to Princeton. But I'm sort of, what, what did happen to the rest? And, and, and how did these end up? At, at HBC, how do they end up at, these 50 end up at the HBCUs? Well, well, before answering that, first off, we, there are about 50 or 60 that we know of, but it could be a much larger group. There have been times, Joe, uh, Joe and I have shown the film, you know, around the country and sometimes often at an HBCU screenings. Mm -hmm. After the screening, uh, an older professor will say, you know, when I was a student, there was a German, there was someone he hadn't thought of him at the time as being part of this community of refugee scholars. But in reality, it was probably a much larger number than the, the ones that Gabrielle or we were able to identify. So that's number one. I mean, what happened to the rest? We don't really know. After the war, probably a small number went back to Europe, but not a, uh, a large amount. And the, the ones that who, who did get teaching positions at black colleges, that was through, you know, the, um, uh, uh, the, the Rockefeller Foundation was involved in trying to find placement positions for refugee scholars. Uh, Ralph Bunch, for example, who was teaching at Howard University at the time was instrumental, for example, in getting, uh, you know, Dr., you know, Professor Hers, who, who was in our film, his position to teaching at Howard. So, you know, it was somewhat by happenstance and, and the work of uh, selected individuals and foundations. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Edwards or Joel, anything to add, add or, to help on that out or that, that you know, it's, I, I found it fascinating also the locations of the HBCUs, you know, I, I think also part of the, you know, being in Atlanta, being right amidst, uh, amongst HBCUs, it's sort of, it's often easy to forget how, they're across the entire country, but primarily the Southeast. But a number of the stories in the film is about uh, the HBCUs in Mississippi, uh, which I found so, you know, hadn't really thought so much. They, they went everywhere, right? They weren't concentrated in one specific area. No, I think there were probably 110 or so HBCUs in the country. And I think uh, Dr. Edwards made a very good point that you have, to, if, if, you have to remember when these scholars came over in the late 30s, there was, anti-Semitism in the United States was a lot more virulent than it is now. So that is partly, Gabrielle talks about a double exile experience. They were driven from Germany. Then they, they come to the United States before the Second World War. 
there's um, there's a distrust of Europeans. There's a whole isolationist movement. There's a lot of anti-Semitism. You know, they had a lot of hurdles to face, and and it was challenging. And you know, the thing is with these white Jewish refugees, all of a sudden they're catapulted out of you know Nazi Germany into a situation where they're white and they're looked at as these strange creatures by the you know the local white res, you know residents. I mean, who are these people? What you know what? And you know, back in Mississippi, there used to be something called the sovereignty uh, councils. I mean, these were surveillance organizations that kept track of who's a potential agitator. So of course, they were all pinned as agitators including Ernst Borinsky, and his story at Tougaloo is, is it's really Hollywood-style drama. I mean, what he did, how he organized his social science laboratories, which is kind of classic, I mean, the story is, you know, he set up this, this table in the basement of some building at Tougaloo, and he would invite students from the White College Millsaps to come over and have a discussion about race. And he set it up so that every other chair one chair had a, had a student from Tugel, the next chair had a, had a white student from Millsap. And this kind of equation, this kind of chemistry sort of provoked kind of interesting uh, conversations. And he conducted this for years and years. And he really wasn't, I think he didn't see himself so much as an activist because he didn't really go out on the protest list. He saw himself as an educator and someone who could facilitate, you know, kind of consciousness. And the interesting thing about these scholars who we met, they always treated, there was not this teacher-student relationship. They really saw their students as part of the group, part of a group that they were just one part of. Another one was Professor Manasseh, uh, who's in the film. <laughs> we found that we couldn't find this guy. We were driving around South, trying North, to like, North Carolina. North Carolina. In North Carolina. We get a, we get a uh, tip that he may be in a nursing institution. So, so we, drove we got the phone book and we went to every you know nursing home before because this was our last day of filming. We were we had to head back to New York City, and we found him and we did our interview and you know sweetheart yeah he was really amazing. Well, Dr. Edwards uh, and don't forget to unmute yourself. Um, you know one of the one of the things one of the themes throughout the film was also about the discrimination that that the Jews. The Jewish refugee scholars faced, but I'm I'm wondering, did they face any discrimination at the HBCUs? I mean, I, I can't imagine that they. You know, it, it must have been very different for them once they arrived. And I'm wondering, you know, I think there was this, a line in the film that they you mentioned the double exile, uh, Joel and Stephen. I, you know, they they went from a very structured learning environment of uh, in Germany and, and and had to bring over this brought over a German way of of teaching, which I think was very different perhaps than the way that the students at the HBCUs were learning. So I'm wondering, did, did they face any discrimination in the universities and colleges themselves? They nor their former students talk about any incidents within the college, uh, uh, on the college campus among students or faculty or administration of any anti-Semitism or rejection of these scholars at all. There was indeed, as, as one would expect, right, a disjuncture, a cultural disjuncture. Uh, these, these professors are cosmopolitan. They're coming from German cities, some of the kind of most urbane cities you know, in the world to small towns in the American South. Uh, so it would be the case for anyone, right? Making that transformation. But black college campuses in the South are in some ways creating their, they have to create their own world, right? Because of the Jim Crow South and segregation and the violence that comes with that. And so the professors really are part of that uh, black bubble in terms of the work they're doing. However, they live in a kind of in a Jim Crow white environment in terms of their, their homes, where their kids go to school, the expectations of the, the community. And Joel and Stephen, I think you can correct me if I'm remembering, was it was it Berinsky who got into trouble with his neighbors because he had black faculty over to his home and students? That was Manasseh. 
It was Manassi. It was Manassi. Yeah. It was Manassi in, in Durham. Okay, thank you. I think you um, liked that, Edwards. It was, it was very tough in them, and it was particularly tough on their children, right? Because the yeah. scholars made a conscious decision to, you know, uh, do this work, to teach in black colleges. They felt a, a kind of, you know, political and moral mission they were on. But their children didn't make that cho choice. They were going with their parents. And I think some of the kids had a hard time. And you can imagine they probably had a hard time at, at school because they were not accepted generally by the white community in those towns. And some of the, the children of the professors who interview in the film uh, talk very poignantly about um, the difficulty in terms of identity, right? Their Jewish identity in a space that is defined by uh, uh, kind of wasp, the, the most wasp whiteness one could imagine. Um, the, their efforts to fit in, uh, their efforts to kind of want a Christmas tree uh, to, to be kind of integrated quite literally. I, I, I'm wondering, and uh, we, uh, I'm wondering maybe Joel or Stephen, while we wait for Dr. Edwards to, to join back in, uh, what kind of influence did they have on the local Jewish communities or were there, or were they really most, for, you know, mostly sort of in, in a bubble all by themselves? They were the only Jews in there at these schools in these communities or did, or was it non, you know, not part of the story, not really what, what we know about? Well, uh, the thing that we heard, I mean, we really didn't get into it to, to a great degree, but there were mixed reactions from what I understand, because some of the, 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 the Jewish community that had, had already ingratiated themselves into, you know, the, uh, the good graces of the, uh, you know, the, the, the white community were a little bit nervous about what this might, what the blowback might be if they became too close to the refugee scholars, but we didn't deal with that to any great degree. I mean, we ended up helping us spin off a, a museum exhibition based on the film with the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. And, and of course the difference between the film and an, one of the differences between the film and the museum exhibit is you, in a museum, you wanna see artifacts, right? You don't want just photographs. But one of the very first artifacts I remember, you know, convincing uh, someone in, in Jackson, Mississippi to loan the exhibit was uh, uh, Berinsky's menorah. And, the, and okay. that became part of the exhibit. So they were part of, they were, tended to be secular, they were very religious, but they were part of their, Jew, in, not all of them, but that we know of, but certainly some like Berinsky were part of the Jewish community in, 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 the, in the areas where they lived. Interesting. And, and for Dr. Edwards, and don't forget to unmute yourself again, um, the, you know, I'm wondering what type of influence did they have ultimately on these, not, not so much their students, but on the institutions where they served? I mean, I, I have to imagine it was, it can go in a variety of directions when you come in totally, you know, into a completely different environment. Well, uh, I, I, I think there is both the, what I would call a long-term effect in terms of the impact on students. And I'll get back to that. But one example of institutional influence is at Hampton, where Lowenfeld really creates the art department. Oh, yeah. uh, and so, right. And so the creation of that department as a serious pursuit for students, many of whom go on to be famous artists, uh, becomes a, a kind of permanent signature of the, the Jewish refugee professor presence. But I, I, I do want to, in some ways, personalize the kind of ripple effect, right, that these professors also have. So one of the things that resonates so, so uh, poignantly for me when I watch the film is that I see one of my own professors from Oberlin College who was mentored at Talladega, right? Wow. Um, uh, by one of these Jewish professors. When I think about uh, Dr. Joyce Ladner as one of the first black women sociologists in the country, um, I recall reading her books as an undergrad at Oberlin. 
And so there's a there's this um, uh, lasting impact that in some ways is almost invisible to us when we think of the way these professors uh, mentored uh, black intellectuals uh, and nurtured them and encouraged them, uh, especially to go into uh, fields where um, most doors were still closed to uh, black professionals. So I think there was both the, the institutional impact, uh, something like Berinsky's social, uh, social science labs, uh, but also a very personal lasting one that we, we may not be able to connect all the dots, but I can kind of give personal testimony that I have received also the results of that learning and teaching that yep. went on at places like tu Tugaloo and Talladega and uh, North Carolina Central. Well, you know, one of the stories that I really uh, appreciated in the film that I, I had never, you know, did you otherwise probably wouldn't know was the story of the, um, the, the student who is sort of forced to apply for a Rhodes Scholarship and sort of begrudgingly uh, so I was wondering if you could share, perhaps one of the three of you could share that story for, the, for our audience. Yeah. I think, uh, Joe, you want, you want to go start with that? I, I think that, um, um, the, I think the point is that these scholars were really advocating for their students and they were ambitious on their behalf, even though many of the students had come, you know, considering the time that this all took place, they were not they were not overly ambitious about their academic possibilities because of racism so this was a case where um i forget which professor it was now who who advocated for it but um he he talked to his students and his students and said listen he insisted that he apply for a for a, for a fulbright mm -hmm. and um the student you know, the student said yeah you know this is just a waste of time, but because he's my professor, I'll go through the effort, I'll do it. And then when he got, when he got the fellowship, he was, you know, of course, you know, very happy, went back to me and he said, but um, uh, I think it was Man um, uh, Manasseh, who was the professor involved, who said, you know, um, he never lorded over, never gave him, I told you so. And I think this is indicative of the kind of relationships that they had. Yeah, um, you know, one, one final, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Edwards. Now, I was going to say another good example is the story that uh, Dr. Joyce Ladner tells about Professor Berinsky, I believe paid for her graduate school application to pursue her, her PhD. Um, and she tells the story of, I think he was the first person she called when she actually received her doctorate in sociology. Uh, which says something about uh, the uh, kinds of relationships that these students and professors uh, created that were truly nurturing, right? Yeah. Uh, nurturing and lasting. Uh, it wasn't just about the, the four years in the college classroom. Yeah. I should mention that, that Berinsky is actually buried on the campus mm -hmm. at Tugel. Wow. Um, that so what, one more question before I believe Daniel will turn it over to audience questions, of which I know that we have we have a, a number. Um, I'm wondering what kind of risk was it to the, the HBCUs? I mean, it wasn't, you know, this wasn't done. I mean, this was both done out of self-interest, I have to believe, for the HBCUs because there were these, you know, wonderful professors who needed places to work. But was there a risk to them? I mean, it, it didn't seem like a necessarily like a, a fit that you would one would think about uh, off the top of your head. I don't think there was a significant risk. One of the things that we assume about historically black colleges and universities is that their kind of entire faculty would have been black faculty, when in fact, the uh, uh, entire history from reconstruction really on through the 1960s is that these colleges had a large number of white faculty. And in fact, in their early decades, it was predominantly white faculty uh, and white presidents and white board of, boards of trustees. And so the kind of interracial context of a black college campus would not have been unusual at all for the campus itself, 
nor would it have been unusual for uh, the uh, kind of Jim Crow uh, white racist environment of the Southern cities. What, what was unusual, in fact, was that these professors were German and were coming from Europe. That was distinctive and unusual. Did they, um, I guess one follow-up question to that before we, we, we turn it over to the audience. Did, uh, did as a result of, of bringing these refugee scholars, did the HBCUs that you're aware of seek to bring in other refugee scholars at, at other points in times in their history? Hmm. Or was this sort of a one, like this was a, a one-time shot and it sort of, you know, did, didn't manifest again? I, I don't really know, but I, my sense is that it was a one-time, it was a kind of a unique situation because remember while the, the faculties were both white and black professors. The administrations of, of HBCUs at the time, and that's changed a lot, tended to, the presidents tended to be white and tended to be much more conservative often than the faculty yeah. and students. And that was a cause for some, some conflict. In fact, uh, Dr. Evans, you mentioned Joyce Ladner, uh, who's in the film. This is not in the film, but, but she and, she and her sister were students at Jackson State and got arrested at a, um, at a civil rights protest and they got kicked out of Jackson State and went to Tougaloo. That's how she happened to meet Berinsky. But, the, but the, you know, the college administration, so anyone who was a protester or being radical as a, a threat to their, to their position in their community and the state and to their funding. And so there, there was some, often some conflict uh, on, the, on those grounds. Hmm. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, uh, I'd like to turn over to you for uh, some questions from our audience. Great, thank you, Dove. Our first question comes from Eleni in Chicago. And for you, Dr. Edwards, how did these German Jewish refugees initially end up on these HBCU campuses? Who facilitated this process? How did the refugees know that this was even an option for them? That's an excellent question that I think Stephen may have mentioned it. The Rockefeller Foundation early in the 1930s begins to organize ways in which uh, they might uh, facilitate um, uh, these uh, um, Jewish refugee scholars who've been uh, expelled from German universities in 1933, uh, ways in which they can facilitate bringing them to, to the United States. The Rockefeller Foundation initially assumes that Nazi fascism will end very quickly and all they're doing is giving these professors a temporary position, temporary positions in the United States. And they will be back to Germany very soon when German, Germany moves back to being a Republican government, right? Uh, and of course that doesn't happen. The, the foundation is concerned about the very strict quotas that white universities in America have for Jewish professors. And so they, they actually don't want to bring too many, as they say. And they specifically say they only want to bring the absolute best. And so for the pr professors like Einstein, who ends, up at, who ends up at Princeton, there are some who end up at the um, uh, at the New School in New York, at Bryn Mawr, University of Chicago. That is the kind of elite stratum that they're focusing on. Of course, by the time we get to the late 30s, early 40s, um, we know that Nazi, Nazism and fascism and Hitler are not going away on their own. Um, they, they also bring in more of a coalition of groups that include the Quakers and also includes what is now the National Council of Churches of Protestant churches. And they all come together because now they realize this is a much bigger crisis than they had anticipated in the 30s. That is when black colleges come in. So black colleges are not discussed at all until around 1941 and a very small number of elite schools are contacted as kind of possible places for these um, Jewish refugee scholars uh, to find positions. Uh, the expectation is that the schools themselves are footing the bills for these additional faculty members, which also is going to limit the number of faculty who are placed 
and limit the number of Black institutions that can actually afford to bring people in, remembering we're talking about the tail end of the Great Depression. And so there's that sort of uh, economic pressure as well on trying to get positions for these uh, uh, Jewish professors. I think it's also interesting to note that um, some of the more established intellectuals like Hannah Arendt and Einstein, of course the major universities wanted them, but the refugee scholars in, in our film tended to be younger. They're just the beginnings of their careers. So you didn't have um, major universities, you know, uh, fighting to get them on staff. They, they didn't even want them at all. And so they were also kind of adrift and really it, were, it was the black colleges that, that gave, lent them a hand and gave them the opportunity to pursue the careers that they really wanted at, to, in terms of teaching. And, and they were, and, and by the way, it also wasn't one sort of faculty area that they were, that they had a focus in, right? The, the scholars were across all spectrums of, of academia, right? Yes. Right. Exactly. They were teaching uh, German, French, math, art, um, sociology, yeah. uh, and, and part of it had to do with the kind of training they had had uh, in Germany, which was really this very broad, um, uh, broad and deep. Uh, learning in languages as well as in the social sciences and humanities. So in fact, that made them even more valuable to historically black colleges and universities that they could teach both the sociology class and a German class and a French class. Uh, and so the breadth of their experience was a very, very high, high value. Thank you. Our next question, this, we can go to you first, Joel, comes from Dale Elman in Milwaukee. One of the things that struck me really seeing this film was the sense of physical danger for violating the rules that these refugee scholars faced potentially or their guests at home faced physical danger and that they had come from a place where they had also faced this physical danger. This wasn't just mean looks or abusive comments. It was actually physical. Is this something you were thinking about as you were making this film? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's clear. I mean, in the Jim Crow South, you could be wiped off the map, you could disappear. And, you know, frankly, uh, people would forget. You know, juries would, would just immediately throw out any kind of uh, um, potential convictions against those who, who, you know, who killed, you know, uh, black people. I mean, you know, so, so yeah, it was clear. I mean, these people were in danger. Um, these people, these refugee scholars were, were living on the edge and it's not a comfortable place to be, especially if you just come out of, you know, uh, Nazi Germany. Thank you. Our next question comes from Richard Ellen. Dr. Edwards, was there any resentment among the existing HBCU faculty, black or white? that professorships were going to immigrants, perhaps preventing Americans from getting those positions? There's no indication of that um, uh, in the record uh, that shows that there was um, any way in which these faculty members weren't welcomed as members of the faculty. Uh, one of the things that the, the Jewish refugee scholars themselves did was to make that uh, um, uh, a very quick cultural adjustment to both an American educational uh, system and style and culture, but also to black culture, right? That was defined at these HBCUs. So these Jewish faculty went to the compulsory chapel because the expectation was every student, every faculty member, every staff member shows up for that weekly chapel without exception, unless you're ill. Um, the style of teaching, which in the United States is far more informal um, than a, a, a German system where, uh, or, or even a European system where professors walk in with their academic gowns on and students are, uh, we should say really kind of um, uh, subordinate and even obedient and deferential. 
to faculty that there is no such thing as discussion and discourse. Uh, so I think what we actually see happen is that the Jewish refugee scholars accommodate the uh, context in which they are teaching and, and living, both as uh, Stephen and Joel said, they have to accommodate the context of a segregated Jim Crow South and also accommodate uh, the black culture, black educational culture that they find at the HBCUs. There, there was a, a wonderful anecdote in the movie about how one of the professors, I forget which one, uh, had a very formal teaching style, but yet he would use the sleeve of his shirt, of his, of his coat to wipe the chalk with and how all the students would sort of laugh at the, the, the informality as a part of the formality of, of his uh, and sort of how he had to adapt. And I, I, when, I, when I think about the way that you share that, I, it, it, it really is, a, it's an interesting insight into how they had to sort of evolve the way that they behaved from a very formal style uh, into a completely different culture. And they also had to learn English <laughs> at, a, you know, at, a, at, a, at a level to teach in English. Yeah. Our next question comes from David Feinberg in Atlanta. And Stephen, I'll address this one to you. Is there a different reaction to the film that over the years that you, when you've screened it, um, when you've aired it for you know, primarily Jewish audience versus say non-Jewish students or at HBCUs? You know, are there are there different reactions that you that you get from the film? Um, you know, honestly, not really. You, you might think that's the case, but when we've screened the films at um, Jewish centers or at some HBC, HBCUs, I think the fact that for most people in the audience, this is a history that they were so unfamiliar with. It's such a surprise that people are just, you know, captivated by it. And I think that the, uh, the, the intensity of the relationship between the professors and their students comes across as so real that um, we've, you know, really, we've, always, we've pretty much always gotten a very positive response to the film. Yeah, I mean, that's, it, yeah, it's, it's, we've made films that had different responses. We made a film back in 1971 called Red Squad about the surveillance activities of the NYPD. And when we first showed it, I mean, we got reactions like, oh my God, how could you turn your cameras? You're doing the same thing the cops are doing. And they were absolutely shocked that we would adopt the same tactics that the cops were doing at the time, which was to kind of surveil any kind of peaceful protest. This film, I think, because it, it, it's got a kind of an emotional context as well as this historical context. And I think the reaction has been, I remember just at one black, black college, some of the younger students got up and said, wow, we really didn't know about this. And they were sincerely grateful that we were showing the film. I've had the same, I've had the same response from uh, audiences and uh, I have not been at an HBCU when it was shown, but of course I have been at the uh, Holocaust and Genocide Studies Center where there was a predominantly Jewish audience. But more recently, my own Methodist church and a synagogue here locally did a joint, kind of came together for the showing. And there are pieces of the history that each knew, and then the other piece that they didn't. Um, and uh, so I think it's the, uh, as Stephen and Joel are saying, the kind of unexpected nature of these histories converging that makes the film so very compelling. And what's wonderful about the documentary as well is that you hear the voices of the people themselves. Now at some documentaries, there's kind of the, narr the constant narration. It's not true for From Swastika to Jim Crow. It's, it's just so moving because you hear the voices of the, of voices of the people who actually created the history and, and for whom it was a lived experience and a personal experience. And you're drawn into those stories. And we were lucky that we were able to film these people because I don't think any of them are left. I think they're all gone. Um, yeah. So we were well, lucky. Everybody from John Hope Franklin, they're all. And we were really lucky to be able to, to be at the right place at the right time. And, and the film was, was um, distributed, uh, at first distributed in, in the year 2000 or 2001. Yeah, I think it, I think right. it premiered on PBS on. Yes, on PBS in 2000. Right. So, 
so 20, I mean, so you're even 20 years past when it even debuted. Um, so I, I, that's actually one of the things that I was thinking about as watching the film was how fortunate we are to have these stories to be able to share. Um, I actually so, have it's a, still relevant, right? <laughs> as relevant now, or maybe more relevant now than it was back then. I, I, I am wondering, you know, a number of the, uh, it seemed to be um, inconsistent. Some of the faculty stayed at some of their colleges for 40 years and some were only there for a few years. Was there sort of, was there an average? Was it consistent? Was it just sort of whatever they want? You know, it's sort of whatever. Actually, I actually didn't know you would ask that question, but I actually have the stats here. Oh, oh, <laughs> but, you know, that's that's what historians do. Um, so, so um, as Stephen and Joel have said, we, we know that the number the number is actually larger than the fifty one that Edgecombe comes up with because some of the scholars don't self identify as Jewish. And then the campus saw them as German, right? And did not, uh, were, were not so aware of, uh, uh, of their Jewish uh, faith and identity. So the numbers I have for the 51 or so is that around 55, 56% were at an HBCU one to five years. So over half of their only one to five years. Uh, 26% are at the HBCU six to 10 years, and 8% are there over 10 years. Yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, we know Professor Hers ended up at, at CUNY, the CUNY Grad Center in, in, in New York, but Professor Manasseh, who's I think the first scholar who's in the film, and there's a section about him closes out the film. Uh, you know, he stayed at North Carolina Central for his uh, um, his entire career. He, even though we had a lot of opportunities to move to more prestigious and prominent universities, he just felt an obligation, and he, he just never left. And Berinsky at Tougaloo uh, as Berinsky, well. Been his entire career there, and in some ways, it's not surprising that that uh, given uh, post World War II, more opportunities will open up for scholars to move into positions uh, That's true. Uh, very true. in other institutions, right? And so that you know, very very narrow um, uh, and limited opportunity that existed in the 30s and 40s shifts uh, uh, significantly in the 1950s in terms of them being able to go to other institutions um, you know, for their own careers, but as Joel and Stephen has said, also for their families and their children. Thank you. We, ha we have another question from Patricia Ecker in Los Angeles, and this is actually sort of following up from the conversation, the question previously, but you mentioned that the film is over 20 years old and feedback is always generally the same amongst groups, but has the feedback changed since you first started uh, showing it 20 years ago versus now, or are you still seeing similar, um, you know, the similar feedback? I think we're still, this, the feedback's similar. I mean, we're, we're, it's always been this kind of positive reaction. This film is, again, as relevant or more relevant today than it was when it was first released. I mean, given the rise of anti, given what's going on in the country today, I mean, the divisions that have become clear and, and the racism and the anti-Semitism that, that, that it's kind of in your face. Yeah, I think the, the, the film stands as a testament to a time <clears throat> and to people who really believe that, uh, you know, they had more in common than they had things that, that, that separated them. I think that's really the lesson of the film, I think. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's been pretty consistent since we first broadcast it. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to uh, get it out on public TV as much as we've wanted to, which has kind of been, been strange. Um, we've had discussions very with WNET, whatever, and it seems to be, well, this has been run already and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, that's a, you know, another ball of wax. <laughs> Thank you. Now coming, 
you mentioned today coming coming looking at uh, at current times elena stewart in cincinnati is asking dr edwards can you tell us that some ways now that universities are collaborating on combating hate racism anti-semitism that we've seen on the rise um I think for, for many colleges and universities, uh, they have a history and tradition of doing that kind of work for social justice and uh, uh, and equality. Uh, I'm on the board of trustees at Oberlin College in Ohio where you know it's part of our history and identity to do that kind of work. And I think what Oberlin's president has done, uh, has done in terms of creating a um, entire initiative on social justice and equity, not only internal to the institution and the institution's commitment to its uh, faculty, staff, and students, but also trying to figure out ways in which the academy uh, looks outside of its own walls and can use uh, its human resources as well as its financial resources to transform society and a belief that it can do that. I think more institutions are doing that since the murder of George Floyd as well as since the bombing of Jewish centers and synagogues and murders in black churches. Um, the level and extent of violence looks so much like, uh, you know, the, the you know, a century ago when uh, lynchings and as I think Joel said, lynchings with impunity and murder of black people um, was uh, simply the, you know, the, 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 the uh, temper of the day. And it seems so much like we're, we're back in that kind of space. Uh, where people's lives are uh, endangered. We all know now that there's a, a, an increase in uh, the uh, racism and bias crimes against Asian Americans. So I think the Academy is taking this seriously, if only because uh, the millennials and college students are demanding it, which is a good thing. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. And I'll say that this is, has by far been the most popular question yet. And I'm sure each of you will, will want to answer. Where can we actually watch the film if we haven't seen it yet? Where can we see the film? How can we continue to share this story with high school students and really highlight this important and little known chapter of, in, in our shared histories? Well, I think that the best thing to do, Cinema Guild, you can Google them, is our main distributor, institutional distributor. I mean, basically for colleges and universities. But I think that, you know, we think that the film is important enough. It, 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 if you go to our website, which is pacificstreetfilms.com, there's a contact number. You can contact us directly. And depending upon the, uh, you know, the, uh, the gathering or the screening, we're always willing to kind of see what we can do to make it happen because we think that it's more important to get this out there and it is to, to, to be concerned about, you know, what the remuneration will be. So yeah, I think we can be contacted directly via Pacific Street Films or if it's for a college or university through um, Cinema Guild in New York and they're on, uh, you can Google them. Do Dr. Edwards, before, uh, as we were speaking earlier, uh, before the program began, um, when we were talking actually about sort of how to use the film as, as a tool, I was wondering if you could share some, some of the experiences that you've had and the ways that you've seen it. Yes, uh, one of, in fact, I, I, in two weeks, I will be doing a presentation without the film, film but based upon uh, Edgecombe's book and, and research. I mean, one of the things I found so compelling is when uh, organizations, churches, synagogues, museums, historical societies, um, um, or we could add, you know, K through 12 education as well. When we bring these audiences together within a community to have this experience of seeing uh, in this history, the way in which our lives intersect. And Dr. Uh, Edwards, please just contact us directly. You can use the film anytime you want. <laughs> I have witnesses, <laughs> a lot please. of witnesses. And Thanks. the other thing I would suggest is for people out there who are listening, please contact your local PBS station. 
I mean, pretty much they are the ones that should be broadcasting this film. I mean, I, as I said, I mentioned previously, we've had problems in recent years with getting this out there because PBS is the perfect venue really to get it out there. So I would say if you had a local PBS station, make a request and you know, see what the response is. Well, I, I just wanna say how much I've enjoyed uh, this conversation with the three of y'all today. Uh, you know, for us, for, for American Jewish Committee and our, and our work with Black Jewish Relations, it's, th this is a major, uh, it is a very important story that we are grateful to be able to share as a part of our platform. Uh, we, you know, for those who, who are able to, you know, consider sharing the, uh, the story from Facebook Live so that others uh, can hear more about it and, and hear some of these fascinating insights. And, and as we further our work in Black Jewish Relations, we'll be sure to continue to share this unique story uh, that, that is not widely known. And so we hope that the next time we talk about it, it, it's absolutely more widely known than it is today. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you everyone. And I'd also like to thank our global audience for joining us today. If you enjoyed this program, please consider visiting AJC.org, consider making a donation. Thank you very much everyone and have a great rest of your day. I know. Thank you. Thank you.